the first thing I want to do is express my commiseration for this community and for the entire Southern California community for the loss of Jackson and his uh, inheritance, what do you call that? Legacy. Legacy will live a long time. Bless his memory. So I'm going to start my timer and hope that my phone doesn't, you know, go to sleep and I have to fiddle with it, but here we go. Uh, this is kind of an opening poem, kind of a sly poem called Flirting with Poetry. And I have to place it where I can read it without hitting the mic. Okay. Flirting with Poetry. I flirted with death, but it turned out to be a misunderstanding. She wanted forever. I wanted a month. <laughs> or two. She agreed to break up, but added, for now, coquettish and unsettling. This is the kind of thing I write when I'm <coughs> waiting for the good poem to show up. Like flirting with, that's not so bad, until one shows up that reassembles my parts. This is not going to be that poem. <laughs> but for just a moment, you were hoping it could be. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to kind of mix it up a bit. I do have a reading list, but I'm going to kind of play it by ear. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Salvador Dali painting that has the floppy clocks. And the title of that painting is The Persistence of Memory. And the title of this poem is The Persistence of Memory. So, when you realize for certain you are losing her, it's like when you have a loose tooth as a kid. You're going to lose it for sure. But while it's hanging by one corner, you worry it with your tongue because it feels good and it hurts. You push it back into its space. You want to keep it. You don't want a hole, but you can't leave it alone. You worry it some more. It feels good and it hurts. You worry it. It worries you. It's coming out. You're going to lose it. Whatever will take its place will take its time. And how foolish you will feel, meanwhile, when everyone can read your loss in your face. But when you thought it was permanent, well, whatever takes its place will never be the real thing. The real thing, when you lose it, it loses you. Loses you in the persistence of memory, in the bending of time, down the rabbit hole, as they say, following the gleam of tooth, the white, her Cheshire grin mocking you as she slowly disappears. Okay. Okay. Uh, last month, uh, last year at this time, uh, uh, let's see, in April, my mother died. In July, my father died. They were 95 full, fulfilling lives. And then uh, my sister died in August. Uh, she's my younger sister. I was sitting outside at her home after the funeral and uh, a I was sitting across from a little plot of garden in her yard in Miami and a line just showed up in my head and very quickly thereafter the rest of this poem showed up. My sister's garden. A garden does not try. A garden does not try to please. A garden does not try to please its keeper. A garden has the simplest diet. Air, water, light. A garden does not know. A garden does not know its keeper. A garden does not know its keeper has died. A garden has the simplest diet. Air, water, light, ashes. 
Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the title of this next poem is the only thing my father ever called my mother unless he was somewhat displeased or in disagreement. Uh, this poem is called Cookie, 1921 to 2016. In the beginning, Rabbi Greenfield said to young Herb Kolker, Betty Galpin is a nice girl, you should ask her out. And many were the tro trolleys he took to visit her across 1930s Cincinnati. Many were the operas they ushered and adored. And many were the prayers that something new called sulfa drugs could save her. And they did. And so he asked. And she said yes. And so they entered the war, the annihilations, and they came through alive and were fruitful and prospered. And many were the times she shouted, F sharp, from the laundry room at the other end of the house as one or the other of her begats tried to decode Chopin. <laughs> many the times she warned, don't play under the piano. And many were the stitches in her heads. <laughs> and she was tough when she wanted something, like three Eagle Scout sons prep school educations, a classroom building for the synagogue, summers chaperoning high schoolers in Europe while Herb stayed home and ate his 13-year-old daughter's cooking. A family photo every year that waxed and waned and waxed again. She could not tell jokes, but she had wit. At 90, a workman told her the new furnace was last 15 years, she replied, Mazel tov. <laughs> Her secret to raising houseplants, I throw out the dead ones. <laughs> she collected art posters, gold coins, dolls, miniature chairs, shopping bags. She dressed Herb, parried his male attachment to old hats and ties. She filled the cup she was given and nourished us, but above all, and always, she was Herb's cookie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a poem uh, in the book, Amnesian Wing, that to my surprise, it is, it's one sentence and that really hadn't dawned on me for a while. It's called Coffee Lizard Monk. My summer neighbor, let me just say, this was up in uh, Idlewild, which is kind of alpine, about 5,000 feet up. Okay, sorry. Coffee Lizard Monk. My summer neighbor makes coffee with a French press, which looks like it could be a glassed-in gazebo for the tiny lizard sunning itself while I smoked on the library steps in town. And watching her make two cappuccinos, I'm thinking, I'll bet that's something capuchin monks never drank, not even after smoking a heretic or two on the steps of the monastery library, not even on a crisp morning like this one in alpine woods where shades of brown and gray defy enumeration, where now the color I focus on is the mottled bronze beige of the foam, which might best be described as fawn, the color of her tanned hand now reaching toward one of the handleless mugs, thumb and fingers spreading in precise anticipation as I imagine they do when reaching for a man's cock lifting the filled mug with exquisite command of gravity and inertia, guiding it toward my own similarly poised hand, though in my case as if ready to encircle a breast, revealing how the same ordinary gestures serve the mundane and the sublime, like a monk kneeling in a garden and in a church, and how, like the lizard, we navigate the immense world in search of warmth, 
hold out our hand for it, carry it to our lips. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I wanted to vary the mood of these things a bit. Uh, this is a poem called Reunification. Time check. Yeah, it went to sleep on me, hang on. Okay, we're halfway there, folks, hang on. Reunification. I want you back, Annette, my South Ossetia, the way it was when your borders lay entirely within mine. Marianne, my Taiwan, what can I do to bridge the gulf between us, to sing again our common language? And Cassie, oh Cassie, my dearest Kosovo, if you came back, I'd make your face my emblem, your name my anthem. All my cherished, missing, breakaway countries, listen to me. I am a failed state, humbled, crumbling, and I want you back. Your climates, your horizons, your parades. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're very kind. I'll read the uh, poem from which the title of the book Amnesia and Wings is taken. You know, beyond a certain level, you, you swear there are two things you will not write poems about. The moon and butterflies. <laughs> But sometimes, <laughs> this poem is called The Caterpillars. They wake like cosmetic surgery patients. Memories of crawling vanish as the sun warms the body they could not have dreamed of. Dog face, Provence chalk hill blue, great spangled fritillary. When the woman I married woke up next to the wrong man, that was my signal to become inert, await rebirth. I want to be great, spangled, fritillary. I want the caterpillar's gift to the butterfly, amnesia and wings. Thank you. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but how I get the news has changed quite a bit. And this is a poem called Gazette. Lonnie is in Florida visiting, visiting her father, possibly for the last time. The patent office ruled that redskins is a degrading term and therefore cannot be a trademark legally. Sarah's cat can open a drawer. If Earth's population represents, is represented by 100 people, fewer than 28 are white. Guns don't kill people, ammunition kills people. Mercury is retrograde. Be very, very careful. All of my female friends are on a spiritual journey. At 10.01 this morning, something happened. Also at 10.30 and 10.47. Donald likes a folk song sung by Leon Bibb. Marie likes a steampunk, steampunk fashion catalog. Tom, Sari, Sarah, Aaron, Tony, Scott, David, Hermione, Alice, Nicole, Richard, and Richard's brother Tim, Nadia, Sonia, Tanya, Antonio, Maurice, and Jack, like the necklace Kathy's husband gave her for their fifth anniversary. <laughs> I like a video of different species sleeping together. Tonight, 
Something about the moon will not happen again until long after we are all dead. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think we had about three more. Uh, this is one of those poems that you, you like because of the way it worked out in your mind and, and how, uh, how something came that out of the blue. It happens a lot when you're writing a poem. You think you're writing about one thing and another, and then, and then a, just a line appears, you know, when your mind is, I guess they say, prepared. And this is one of those poems, and I, I read it a lot, so I apologize to the people hearing it for the 92nd time. Here it is, also in, also in the book. It is called Projector. Half sewing machine, half tank, it was the closest thing I knew to a holy relic. Elders fetched it from the closet like the Ark of our Covenant with the past. First came the ghosts of those who lie in the ground, jerky simulacra dancing tisticato chatter. Then came the famous lineup of the nine cousins, four in diapers, Three crying, all with chicken pox. Then here we are, recognizable at last in F Florida, making faces at the camera. In the background, dolphins leaping. O oh, maker of humanity in its image, O oh, moving art, you made light of us all. We glowed. Okay, we're pretty much through the list here. So I'm going to close with my closer. <laughs> what do you do, right? I've probably mentioned to those of you who've heard it before, this came out of a workshop with uh, Charles Harper Webb. By the way, I want to mention uh, that poetry and writers contest, it's every two years, California Writers Exchange. The prize is a all expense paid one week in New York City visiting any authors, editors that you want. And you go, I, the fiction winner and the poetry winner go together and we each get a list of about 200 people who want us, who are willing to, you know, be visited by us when we're in New York. And we, they put us up in Washington Square. It's just magnificent. And my first, first guy on my list was Edward Hirsch, who's the head of the Guggenheim Foundation. So we started off in his office. Uh, and he actually had read my poems. <laughs> But uh, the fiction writer chose Michael Cunningham. We had drinks with Michael Cunningham. I wanted to meet the uh, poetry editor of Knopf, uh, Deborah Garrison at the time, and it was that kind of visit. It, whoa. So whether the poetry was that good or not, the prize was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about a crush. The title is the first line. I have a crush on the girl with the pierced lower lip. The girl with the pierced lower lip have I a crush on. With the pierced lower lip girl on a have I crush. I have a pierced girl, the lip with crush on the lower. A crush have I on the with lower lip pierced girl. I have a crush on the lip with the girl pierced lower. Lip girl lower. A have crush I on with the pierced. I pierced a crush on the lower lip girl with a have. Lower have I pierced a lip with a girl I crush on. I the crush the, the girl lower lip on a pierced have with on girl I lip the the with crush a lower have pierced. I have a crush. A crush. A crush on, oh, lip. 
Oh, Pierce. Oh, girl. Oh, have. Thank you so much. Thank you.